Uh, on behalf of Google and the many Googlers here and those tuning in around the world, welcome. It's great to have you here. We're also fortunate to be here in conversation with Clement Wolf. Clement leads Google's global public policy strategy on a number of search and economic issues, notably including the economic impacts of machine learning. And with that, I'll let you guys take it away. Jerry Kaplan, everyone. Well, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. I don't think you could be in front of a crowd that cares more about the impacts of AI and where it's going. Uh, I mean, this is not your first rodeo. You've been here before, so by now you know how this goes. Um, I think we have uh, an amazing opportunity to chat with you for an hour and delve into some of the things you discussed in, in your book. As a start, it would be great to hear how, how that specific book came to be. What drove you to think about it? Why write about AI right now? Well, the... Um the answer is not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Try us. Um, uh, Oxford University Press has a series called What Everyone Needs to Know. Just so you know, it's, it's such a pompous title, I did not make it up myself. <laughs> and so they, they do it on every subject, you know, Islam, the Federal Reserve, uh, global warming. They have, uh, uh, it's a book that's written, these books are short, they're easy to read, they're not dumbed down, but a clear and simple uh, explanation of a particular topic so you know enough to go to a party and be a know-it-all. And so that's really what this is about. So they asked me if I would write this book and uh, I thought that was a great opportunity. But after that I realized that there's really a niche for this book that is unfilled. There really isn't a book that's uh, for an intelligent uh, literate audience um, about artificial intelligence that really explains the whole field, what it means, how it works, et cetera. Um, we're lucky for the people on camera uh, can't see this, but Peter Norvig's here, who's a luminary in the field. And uh, you know, he, he's a real superstar. And he's written the book that I learned from uh, <laughs> on uh, a modern approach to artificial intelligence. If I had more time, I would have made a shorter book. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I cut out the last 1,000 pages of my book, too. But the, <clears throat> the, uh, the point is, if, if you read that book, it's really a, it's almost a cookbook, a technical book, covering all the different techniques and all that. But it doesn't really explain it in a way that, uh, for a uh, person who is not an engineer or is not trained as a, uh, uh, in, in that, that, those kinds of disciplines. And so there isn't a book that I'm aware of that really takes this and explains it in down-to-earth, uh, simple language, but without, without, as I say, dumbing it down, so we, you know, it gets into what this is, is um, really all about. So that's why I wrote it. That's what it's for. And uh, you're welcome to read it. It's simple and easy. And then you can go to any cocktail party and be the life of the party after that. <laughs> that's a good promise. Um, one of the things to start with, uh, and which I think was, what I think is very interesting, is the sort of constant uh, ebb and flow of the uh, history of AI. Uh, yes. with uh, a trend for ex ante overpromising, And I think one of the examples you mentioned is uh, this quote um, by McCarthy, Mac McCarthy, I think, in 1956. Yes. Uh, that's a year from that first conference on AI, uh, significant progress would have been made <coughs> towards uh, actual machines emulating human thinking. Uh, so overpromising quite constantly. But then again, um, a trend to ex post uh with the idea that once it's solved, it's not AI anymore. Uh, and so a lot of hype cycles, and I guess the question for us here today is, do you think what we're seeing here uh, over the past few years is one more of these hype cycles that's gonna come down eventually, or are we now in something that's really new or something very different is happening? Well, both of those things are true. Um, we are definitely in a hype cycle. I've lived through them. This is just what they're like. You'll, you'll, you'll know it when, uh, when the bubble bursts. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't very valuable technology and a lot of incredible uh, effects that this is going to have on society. And those uh, are not really being talked about in the right way because the problem with AI is it's sort of sexy and exciting and it's full of gee whiz. And we need, as a group of scientists and engineers, which is, I assume, mostly what we have here in the room, to get the gee whiz out of this field because it's distracting us from really understanding the societal impact that this kind of technology is going to have. So it's sucking the oxygen out of 
the uh, conversation when we're talking about the singularity and machines rising up and taking over. And of course, the main question I get when I speak is, you know, did you see Westworld? Uh, you know, and uh, we were joking before this, uh, which is true, that every presentation has to have a picture of the Terminator in it. So usually I just put up that picture right at the start and say, here's, here's a picture of the Terminator, now let me get on with the talk. <laughs> because, because artificial intelligence, there are different ways to look at it and different ways to frame the problem. And I've come to the sad conclusion that the current framing, which is that we're building machines which are growing ever more intelligent, and that these are rising up some kind of uh, linear uh, objective scale toward uh, human intelligence, and oh my god, what are we going to do when they start to exceed us, and then they are going to have, do bad things to us, potentially, or they'll get out of our control. That this is not a helpful framing of the problem. And that's because there is no they there. A much better way to think about all of these things and the problems and the benefits is to think about artificial intelligence as a natural continuation of the long-standing historical process of automating tasks that require human labor, effort, and attention. And if you think of it that way, you can illuminate what's going to happen over the next couple of decades by going back and looking at the long history of automation over the past two or 300 years. That wasn't your question, but that's what I wanted to say. That was a great answer. <laughs> it's a Feel great answer to, to ignore the question. question. That's fine. Right. Uh, moving on to a different question then. Okay. Um, you, you just mentioned how the idea of a scale with the evolution of AI towards human intelligence may be biased or flawed. Uh, however, in the book, um, you certainly discuss the idea that uh, even the idea of human intelligence may be flawed in some way. Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's an interesting idea for this audience to discuss. Uh, could, would you mind elaborating a bit? Sure. There is a mythology which has reinforced this whole hype cycle in AI, that intelligence is some kind of uh, uh, objective, linear, measurable quantity. And this person is IQ is 125, and this one's only 120, and so there's, this person's smarter than that person. But let me just talk about IQ, because that, that's a great illustration of why this is a myth. If you talk to the people who developed IQ, the psychologists and that deal with this, it's an intelligent quotient, intelligence quotient, they call it. And uh, it's really not about intelligence at all, what they'll tell you. They'll tell you it's a measure of developmental competence which is why you mostly apply it to young children. What they mean is, do you have a certain set of skills, and at what age did you gain those skills? Were you capable of doing that? And so after you're about 15 or 16 years old, IQ is a fun functionally meaningless. Um, now, because it's, it's a quotient. You guys know what that means. You, you score a bunch of tests, and you divide it by your age, and that's your IQ. Well, I must be really dumb, because I'm really old, and that's the denominator. <laughs> Uh, so the whole concept of intelligence, as it's understood by the general public, is mistaken. Uh, it's really uh, what we think of as intelligence. It's not an objective, uh, measurable quantity. It's more like our concept of, say, beauty. You know, is this person more beautiful than that person? Now, that's a question one can ask, and you can even have a, a meaningful answer. Yes, in general, this person is regarded as more beautiful than that person. But we don't talk about that as a linear scale where, if you've noticed, if you watch movies in which there are robots, they've been becoming better and better looking. You know, they, they, they start out, you know, as uh, Robbie the robot, and they've come along very far. But we don't have conferences where we're worrying about robots becoming so beautiful that we no longer want to mate with human beings because we want to mate with the robots. Well, this is the, the corollary of the, the mistake mistaken path that we're led down with this notion that human intelligence is a, a sort of a flat linear scale. It's really a series of complicated capabilities and competencies uh, that we have. I don't think of a spider as really smart because it knows how to spin a web. And so I don't think of a person as really smart because they know how to program in Java. It's, uh, it's really just a set of competencies that one develops. So now as we apply that to machines, think about IQ, if I can continue for a minute. Think about IQ as applied to a machine. How do you divide by its age? What happens if you give an intelligence test to a machine? Well, it can perform calculations, by way of example, one of the key elements of the IQ test. I mean, millions of times faster than a human being. Oh my god, does that mean it's going to take over the Earth? No. 
Of course not. And you, how do you divide by a machine's age? Oh, we built that one 15 minutes ago, so this, you know, this IQ <laughs> must be you know, 100,022. Um, clearly, we shouldn't be thinking about framing the problem in this particular way. We're using these machines precisely because they perform jobs or tasks, not jobs. That's another part of the conversation. Better than humans do. They do them faster, or they do them less expensively, or they do them with, uh, more accurately, or whatever it might be. We use these machines because they exceed human capabilities. So with the general public worries about, oh my god, what are we going to do when machines get smarter than us? They already are. And that's the whole point. So I'll stop there. Oh, don't stop. The audience continue. <laughs> I can go on for an hour on this. That is pretty much the point. That's why we have you here. Um, and so it's since the machine is already um, smarter than us in some ways, uh, one other point you raise, and which I think is, um, is a, a relevant one for comparison, is the idea of a machine free will hmm. and machine consciousness. Do you see that as related in any way to intelligence? Do you see that as a, as a possibility? Um, the, the real answer is, of course, I don't know. But um, it does raise questions when we build machines with these capabilities of whether they might ultimately, we might ultimately regard them as having free will or being conscious. And uh, there's a lot of interesting work on this in the philosophical literature. I, I happen to be a follower of, uh, what's his name, uh, Sam Harris. Thank you, Sam Harris. Uh, terrible with names. The first thing that goes when you get to my age are the names. <laughs> it's a FIFO Q and the names are, they just strip them out, you know, it's a, you know, it's a hash function, it just goes down. Uh, I can make jokes like that in front of this audience. Um, well, basically what Sam Harris pointed out in, in terms of free will, and I happen to agree with him after a lot of thought, is that it's fundamentally, our common sense notion of what it means to have free will is fundamentally in conflict with our sci current scientific framework and worldview. The two just don't fit. You have to introduce some kind of magic to the idea that independent of the world around you and independent of all the history of every event that took place up to a point in time, you decided to turn left instead of right and you could have done something differently. That's simply inconsistent with our scientific worldview. And I'm not, just, I'm not suggesting that the world is entirely deterministic. I, I'm just saying that what does it mean for this mind to be somehow outside of that or separate from the physical world in such a way that it gets to stop and think and make a decision that is not in some sense determined by everything that has come before. Uh, so I don't think, I think there's a good argument that free will is actually an illusion, either that or we do not yet have the scientific framework or, or ideas that we can use to explain it in a reasonable way. And as uncomfortable as that might be, I think that's the, uh, the conclusion that one has to reach. And the same thing is true of consciousness. But underlying both of these questions, can a machine ever have free will? Can a machine be conscious? Everybody here has seen, uh, how many people have seen Westworld? OK, so I can, I, there's dozens of films and uh, basically around this theme. When does the machine come alive? When is, 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 does it uh, become independent in its thinking? The really underlying issue in that is at what point, if ever, do we owe the courtesy of our empathy to human created or mechanical machines and devices? That's really the underlying question because immediately after you see another TV show like Humans, how many of you have seen Humans, the British TV? One person. Okay, well, I'm not here to promote the humans. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the real question always becomes, are these simply tools which we can abuse and treat the way we treat any other tool? I don't think of myself as abusing a hammer when I use it. Actually, I guess I could. I often break hammers and things. So I suppose it's a form of abuse. Um, but at, at what point do they, in some sense, deserve uh, having some semblance of rights in and of themselves? And uh, that's the reason we worry about this issue, whether a machine can have free will or not. A machine can certainly act as though it has free will. I know. I've got a, I've got a MacBook. And, uh, <laughs> and if that thing doesn't have free will, nothing does. So, uh, but I don't feel like I owe it a, a, an opportunity to go off and 
just have this little spinning wheel at any time it wants to because it needs a break. I don't have that, that same sense of empathy that I do for uh, not just for humans, but for many other living things. And that's a really good segue into the second part, I guess, of that conversation, which is we now have brushed upon the fact that, well, if uh, maybe in a hype cycle, but things are changing fast either way. Uh, and we don't know if there's a, a huge difference or what the difference is between the way humans are intelligent and the way machines are intelligent. We know that's not the same thing. It's, it's not even on the same scale. We don't know how to relate them. We know that consciousness and that uh, free will may be flawed notions. So what then makes a very advanced machine that different from a human and in a, in a, in a world where they keep getting well, more, prevalent, more pervasive and more sophisticated, what does that mean in terms of uh, legal and economic impact? And I think the first stage of that is uh, legal impact, of course. Since if we can't say if a machine is really conscious, if we can't say if a machine is really intelligent, if we can't say if, it's really, uh, if, it ha if it has free will, then what can we do about questions like ownership, uh, which you raise, uh, questions like uh, accountability? Uh, how does that play out in your view? Um, while, even though I have been describing the, uh, the AI world as merely an extension of uh, previous uh, uh, types of technology, I do think it raises a number of new and very challenging questions for society. And we have different ways of dealing with it. I, I don't think we have any obligation to, uh, to machines. I don't, I, my car... Uh, you know, I may take care of it, but not because I think it has some rights. I think the same thing will be true of any machine that we're likely, any of us are likely to interact with in our, in our lifetime. However, from a legal standpoint, there are certain legal fictions which are useful in sorting out the primary question of who is responsible for what. So as you may know, corporations have a, this concept of personhood that is applied to corporations. It doesn't mean they're people. It means that there are certain collections of rights and responsibilities that go hand in hand. And that's what we call personhood, even if it's limited. And uh, there's also, interestingly enough, not all people have the same rights and responsibilities. Uh, you guys don't need a license to do machine learning. But there are, in the law, for example, you need a license to practice law. And you have certain responsibilities, and then you're given certain rights to be able to work in, the, in that profession. So uh, this notion of a combination of rights and responsibilities is a very powerful one and a very useful one in a legal context. And I don't think it's at all unreasonable to expect that courts will find that certain classes of devices uh, could be given legal personhood in the same uh, limited sense in, in the future. So that's something that we need to, that will have to be worked out. Um, but Here's the good news. Everybody's been worried about, like, oh my god, what happens when uh, the self-driving car is going to crash? Who is responsible? Well, assigning responsibility is a very important issue. But it's not such a great philosophical mystery. There is a tremendous amount of history and work in the legal profession for sorting out who is responsible for various kinds of accidents, from the manufacturer to the user to the, uh, the person who sold you a particular device. Have they explained properly and told you about what the, the dangers are, et cetera, et cetera. And the short answer to this question is, we don't need to worry about it. Because the lawyers are going to handle this. They'll sort it out. And it's not going to be a big issue. Uh, in particular, if I can come back to the self-driving car, we don't need to worry about it because the insurance companies are going to drive the adoption of this technology for a variety of economic reasons. And you won't care. You got into an accident. The insurance company will handle it. And whether they go back and say it was a flaw in the design or a flaw in something else, or uh, you were drunk and you instructed your car to go run somebody over, you know, that's, then you're, re you're responsible. So uh, to me, this is a, uh, uh, as a practical matter, it's a non-issue. We have experts who will take care of these things for us in reasonable ways through the legal system. But it will require a lot of precedent and, and future work. Uh, absolutely. And I guess as um, one point I would respond to that is of these things will be handled ultimately, mm -hmm. but they can be handled in more or less effective and more, way, more or less beneficial ways for society and, yes. uh, and for individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's certainly one key consideration, especially when it comes to the, uh, to the question of labor uh, and the question of the uh, uh, impact of automation on employment. 
there has been a lot of discussion about this, of course, uh, and a lot of considerations that there may not be as, as many jobs 20 years from now as they are today. Uh, what do you stand on that? Okay, um, this is a broad and complex subject, but let me try to quickly summarize this in the spirit of my short answers in, 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 in my book. If you view artificial intelligence not as the emergence of some new form of life that is heading towards singularity and we're all going to suddenly uh, be raised up and reincarnated in, in mechanical form, and instead think about it as a continuation of the longstanding process of automation, then you can look at uh, two effects that automation have had in the past. And what we're seeing, if certainly a continuation of and possibly an acceleration. The first is automation changes the nature of work. So it's true when you read about, my God, 50% of the jobs are, will be gone in 30 or 40 years. That's the first half of the sentence. The other half of that sentence that you never hear is that's normal. If what people did 20 or 30 years ago is not what they do today. And there'll be a whole bunch of new jobs and an expansion of other kinds of jobs for very important economic reasons uh, to, that will, uh, there'll be plenty of work. So the, these two statements are not, in, not in, as inconsistent as they sound. 50% of today's jobs might go away and pick your number of decades. And uh, there'll be still be plenty of work and, and people will still be employed. You know, if you just go back and look at everything from, uh, I'm going to give you an idea how old I am here. I remember, barely, but I remember when I was a kid, you pick up the telephone, there was no dial, and a person would get on the line and say, uh, what do you want? What number, number please, I think they used to say. And you would tell them, Bigelow 4200. I mean, this actually went on. So there were people, I think there were a million people, I could be mistaken on that, employed as telephone operators. And you would tell them, and they would plug things around. Now, that switching function, as you're well aware, has been taken over by the, it's called ESS, the Electronic Switching Systems. And all those people are out of work. Oh my god. Well, the problem isn't that they're out of work. It's that the nature of the work changed. And because that, that these improvements make us wealthier as a society, that creates a lot of demand, not just for new kinds of jobs, but for all kinds of jobs. Let me give you an example that I, I just noticed these as I go about my, my humdrum daily life. Um, <clears throat> right now, getting a massage from masseuse is a bit of a luxury. I mean, all of you, of course, can afford this. Uh, in fact, I think they're free here at, here at Google. It's one of the reasons I'd like to work here. I'll just do that part. I, I want the job of testing the new masseuses. That's my, that's going to be my that job. That really is a job. It is? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It doesn't look good on video. I've learned when you laugh, you know, about, about these things. But that is funny. Uh, OK, that totally threw me off. <clears throat> OK, now, what happens when you no longer need to buy your own car, or your cost of transportation drops by 75%. You have more money. Well, what are you going to do with that? A lot of people are going to step up and want to do things like get massages or go to the spa for a day. And that's going to generate tremendous demand for that profession. I've been surprised locally. That's an incredibly well-paid job. You know, talking about manual labor, you know, it's, uh, it's a very well-paid job. And there's going to be tremendous demand in the future for uh, massage therapists. Well, that's a side effect. We, we often think we're destroying a job. Uh, what, what's going to happen? Well, the answer is that money goes to expanding and changing the uh, complexion of the workforce so that existing jobs of certain kinds become uh, much more prevalent, and we need more and more people to do them, personal shoppers or people to do flower arranging or whatever it might be. Uh, so. Uh, the way in which the labor markets work is they're very resilient and very uh, dynamic. And so while it's true the jobs are going to go away, there will be new jobs. And more importantly, there will be more of certain kinds of existing jobs. And I'm convinced that this pattern is going to play out in the future as I've thought about it. That said, we're putting people out of work. The other thing about automation, two things that they never want to say when you're uh, when IBM makes its uh, presentations and other tech companies, we're not putting people out of work. <clears throat> oh, okay. uh, of course they are. That's the whole point of automation, is to put people out of work. 
So you're putting people out of work, and the question is, what do you do with those people? Do we have the uh, social uh, po and policy frameworks in order to ensure that we're not, the cost of the automation is not falling disproportionately on certain groups of people? What are we going to do with the millions of drivers who are going to be out of jobs in the next 10 to 20 years? We can just cut them loose. Maybe that would be the current administration's point of view on something like this. I don't know. But um, you know, we need to set up uh, mechanisms. And it, it's uh, incumbent on us as uh, thinking human beings and empathetic human beings to, to figure out better and better ways to reincorporate people into the workforce in, in, in proper ways. In, in a sense, this is what went wrong with globalization. Uh, the benefits accrued to a certain small group of people and the costs, I'm sorry, the benefits accrued broadly across much of society, and some people benefited tremendously. But there was a small group of people, maybe like the steel industry or the you know, coal industry, that were devastated. And we didn't pay attention to that. And now we're suffering that and the backlash from that. <clears throat> the same thing is going to be true with the rollout of a lot of the work that's going on right here at Google. You guys are going to be fine. It's not going to be a problem. But you're going to be replacing people who may not have the opportunities to retrain or to become, continue to be productive members of society. And if we don't address this on a policy level, we're going to see the same kind of backlash. That is very fair. And that's one thing we spend quite a lot of time thinking about, yep. uh, wondering what we can do to help people upskill, to uh, think of new types of social safety nets. And there's, of course, I don't think we've seen a compelling and uh, foolproof answer just yet. Uh, I think a lot of people around the world are thinking about that. It was interesting to me to see that, um, I mean, I, I'm a French man, obviously, that's my accent. Uh, the, um, the, the winner of the left-wing primary for the French election, uh, Benoit Hamon, uh, won on a program that's based on UBI uh, in response to the prospects of technological change. What's interesting to me uh, is that it comes from an optimistic perspective. His view is that it's a good thing if people work less. Working less, generally OK. Uh, only issue is how do we share the benefits of that. And so he believes UBI may be a solution for that. That's a whole other conversation that I'd love to have with you, but it's already uh, 36, and I want to leave time for the audience. I guess the last question I would selfishly ask before opening it up is uh, we've talked a lot about some of the stakes, some of the considerations you have about what AI will be and what impact it will have. What's one thing that really gets you excited, that you're really looking forward to, that you think is going to happen, a breakthrough that's coming soon? Well, the, the most obvious thing is the changes to our transportation and, and shipping infrastructures. But talk about preaching to the choir. How many of you, how many of you in the room are working on uh, self-driving uh, technologies? <laughs> no? <laughs> we have uh, Alphabet has split now. OK. They're, in another, they're off working on it. And you guys are, <laughs> you, you guys are good. <laughs> right, that's, that's right. Well, I mean, when, when I was a, <clears throat> a little bit younger, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, they used to say, well, what are we going to do when machines can program themselves? And in a way, you hear that again. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit off of your, your topic. Uh, in the sense that, we, that I programmed machines when I was a, a working uh, work day engineer, um, we have done that. You know, the, the languages are higher level. Uh, the machines program themselves. Uh, today. Uh, we don't lay out uh, chips by hand anymore, obviously. We have great, great tools to do that. So the nature of that work continues to change. And I somehow got completely off your, uh, That's your point, which was? Which was uh, one thing that really gets you excited. One thing excited, that really gets me excited. Uh, and you want to see happen, and you're well, seeing on the, on the horizon. Well, the, the, I don't think the impact of this revolution, where we mate uh, sensory perception with the ability, with machines that can perform functions. There's almost existing technology on that side, the stuff that you guys work on on the sensory perception side, we mate those two together, you get a very powerful combination. Only one example is the self-driving car. And when you do that, a whole variety of tasks that previously, where machines previously were confined to factory floors because they, they couldn't sense their environment, now these machines are going to come out of those environments and be in and around people. And that's going to have a dramatic impact, not just on labor, but on uh, improving our lives, making us wealthier, and allowing us to, to do things in, in, in greater safety or be better informed, uh, 
at, at a far lower cost than, than it ever uh, could be done before. And I don't think people realize how this revolution is going to, uh, the, the enormous impact that this particular revolution uh, is going to have, because it's, it's going to be quite dramatic. The problem is, and I want to talk about this for you guys, we're working on the technologies, but there are tremendous barriers to the social acceptance of the kinds of systems and devices that we're uh, creating. And building machines that uh, abide by our normal social conventions, human social conventions, when they're operating around and with us, is an area that is just in its infancy. And we don't really have a good theory about this. You know, when do you, is it OK? Will it be OK for a robot to go wait in line for you? Uh, is that acceptable or not? What does it mean? How are you going to feel the first time your self-driving car, which can park itself, somebody else's self-driving car can zoom into a spot and take a spot, and there's nobody in it, and you need to park your car. Is that OK, or is that not OK? I can go on and on with lots and lots of examples, but what we haven't paid adequate attention to is what kinds of theories of social behavior and normal conventional norms of society, how do we take those and codify them and put them into the uh, behavior, if I could anthropomorphize a little bit, of these machines in a way that people will find acceptable. Yeah. So in this age of uh, polarities and people not able to see eye to eye, is it actually uh, an era of hope with AI beginning to find a deep similarity between humans rather than the differences we tend to focus on? For example, uh, Google has found that in spite of languages being so different, there's a deep uh, commonality at the heart of the language, almost at a biorhythm level. So if you think of mother and I think of Mata and somebody else thinks of Ma, it's the same biorhythm expressed in different ways. And so it's beginning to expose that through computation. So, um, and so, so the expressions are different, but there's deep commonality between humans, right? So is there actually hope that AI can bring us together by finding more of these similarities versus, you know, scaring us into being more uh, reclusive? Well, you know, there's a, a long history in linguistics of study on this. And those who are uh, Chomsky, Chomskyans, Chomskyites, uh, will we'll recognize that uh, his, his whole theory is that there's a fundamental basis for, uh, for language. Whether or not that's true I, you know, is a matter of some debate. But uh, I think that to the extent that we reflect human behaviors in this, uh, I'll call it a mechanical or electronic mirror of these machines that we're building, it can obviously help us to inform uh, us about what our own capabilities are and what the commonalities are uh, among different cultures and, and different, different people. Um, now, that's sort of the positive view on this. The other is that when we hold up this giant technology mirror that we're doing to society, for example, in, in social media, uh, it, it's going to adopt the same kinds of biases and uh, negative aspects of uh, human co conflict and behavior that uh, that we uh, see in ourselves. So let's be very careful when we look into this mirror about what we're going to see. It may be about what's common in expanding our view of uh, inclusive, wider and more inclusive, or it may become a tool for us to be uh, distinguish ourselves from thinking of other people as other and not wanting to be concerned about, uh, like today, the, the, uh, the, the role of immigrants versus uh, me first kind of attitude. That, that we're, we're making a, a, a turn that's not necessarily good for all, all the world. Uh, but um, uh, I think that, that that's the way that I, I look at the, this problem. It's, it's informative. It will be helped to inform us about our own human nature. The, the machine nature will help to inform us about our own human nature. That there is a more or less equilibrium between demand and supply in the overall labor markets. Mm -hmm. And as automation changes demand or reduces demand in one labor market, the assumption is that technology creates a new one, right? If you need less coal miners, maybe you need more solar panel installers. Will that assumption always hold true? Well, this isn't a law of nature, but you just have to look at it. Historically, that has been the case. The concern that we're putting everybody out of work is hundreds of years old. 
And this question, this problem has been brought up repeatedly over time. Now, that's not to diminish the uh, tremendous personal cost that accrues to people who are displaced by the new technology. But I just don't see any reason why this, this is not going to, uh, the same balance is just going to come back into, that it will come back into balance uh, even, if we dis, uh, even if we displace a, a large number of people. Of course, the question is when and how long does that take? And what are we going to do uh, in order to minimize the social and economic impacts of that? You know, the big picture is pretty simple. We're doing things that make us wealthier as a society, significantly wealthier. Most people don't realize that the uh, average household income in the United States has doubled reliably uh, every 40 years for over 200 years. It's incredible how much wealthier we are than our parents were, even though you might not see it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and our grandparents, and going all the way back, the average household income in the United States 200 years ago was $1,000 a year. It's about the same as it is in, I think it was Gambia and a couple of uh, uh, agrarian uh, African countries. And yet we don't think back on uh, uh, Ben Franklin's time and think, my god, those people were dirt poor. Um, now, what, if that pattern is likely to continue. So we're going to have another 100% of wealth uh, compared to today in 40 years, so we'll double the amount of wealth. The question is how do we, how do we uh, distribute that uh, uh, properly among the workforce? It may be, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, universal basic income. You didn't use the term, so a lot of people on the video probably will not know, know what that is. But that's only one approach uh, to this particular problem. I think it's self-correcting, but we need to pay attention to it. We shouldn't be worrying about whether machines are gonna come alive and take over the universe. We should be worried about whether or not the pace of automation is increasing or we're going through an, another wave of increase in automation, primarily due to uh, machine learning today. And uh, how is that going to affect different aspects, different portions of society? And what do we do to mitigate the negative effects? And if I just may, I have one, a, few, a few points about that, actually. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, to your point, demand changes uh, for employment. But employment itself, itself changes. Uh, in 20 years from now, what we think of as a job may be very different, not just in terms of content, but in terms of structure. Maybe we'll have a way more gig-centered economy. Maybe we'll have a much shorter work week overall, because that's just how we think. Uh, our work week is much shorter than our grandparents. Uh, so it's just not the same thing. Uh, so that's one, one factor that's important. Um, another one is, the, you were mentioning the speed and the scale of automation and how it impacts the economy. Uh, to your point about uh, regulation being a, a key driver for that, even if the technology gets there early on, uh, if the rules and the society doesn't change at the same pace, there may be a buffer there that we are underestimating. Now, it may be a very bad thing for a lot of reasons because it stops innovation. It may be actually an okay thing from the perspective of jobs displacement in the sense that it gives more time for societies to adapt. So that's also a parameter to have in mind. I think the, the key issue is it's, it's a question of the speed of transformation. If you go back 200 years, as you may know, more than 90% of the US population worked in agriculture. What it meant to work was to be on a farm and do farming work. That, that's what jobs were. Only, everything else was just 10% of that. Now, today, less than 2%, and based on a lot of the work that's going on here, we're going to be able to automate 75% of that 2% pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, basically, all the people did was grow and, and, and consume food. And that represented, I think, 40% of the average person's budget. Today, it's way less than 10%, which is kind of, kind of exciting. But we're not all out of a job. You know, we've, we've got other things to do because our expectations continue to rise, uh, et cetera. But uh, I, I have a, uh, maybe a radical statement to make here that I would not make elsewhere. This is not your problem. You guys should be out there generating the technology which is going to make society wealthier and as a <coughs> Slight side effect worth mentioning, you wealthier and the owners of Google stock wealthier. But that is not your problem, to be worried about public policy. Actually, it is Clem's job. So he, they, they let one guy <laughs> out of 50,000, and uh, he, he could do that. No, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to be concerned with this. But the idea that we should not do this is, is silly. It's a little bit like saying, now we can uh, connect phone calls electronically. We'll, we're going to suppress that technology so that all of these telephone operators still have jobs. 
it's obviously the wrong approach to take. Do your jobs, generate that wealth, make the future, give us the opportunity to make the future better, and let the people who worry about policy and uh, social uh, cohesion figure out how best to address those side effects. Job security. <laughs> So, uh, so to follow up on that, then, uh, one question I always wonder from the perspective of anybody who's making a choice about what kinds of innovations to work on, an obvious question is, do you, can you give any color around uh, some aspects of automation just change the jobs of people and they stay in place and become more powerful, like your example of the compiler? Other examples of automation, though, do cause displacement. Do you have any thoughts about yeah. how those sort out? Um, well, I would argue that they all cause displacement. Let me explain that. <clears throat> People worry about machines coming and taking our jobs. But machines don't take jobs, don't do jobs. They perform tasks. And if you look at what a particular individual does, usually there is some range of tasks that they're involved in. Now, if you automate 50% of those, you make the argument correctly that you're making that person much more productive. You're freeing them up from routine work, typically, uh, and give them time to focus on the things where they add the value the most. So that's great. We're making programmers more productive. What does that mean? We need fewer programmers. We actually need a lot today, but in general, you know, that means we would need, if we were all programming an assembly language, this place would be the size of a uh, major country in terms of what would be necessary to accomplish uh, the, the, the things uh, that, that, that you do. So, uh, however, if your job consists of a single task, I lay bricks. I pick, or I drive a car. I pick up the brick, I put it here, I put the mortar on, and that's what I do. You can build a machine that does that. And if you do only tasks that are automatable, obviously you're going to be out of a job. So I think this is a false dichotomy that you hear a lot about. Are we making people more productive, or are we putting them out of work? And that somehow this bleeds into our design. I think that's not really the case. I think what is the case is we tackle tasks. You know, they're very important tasks with tremendous economic benefit, like making a machine that plays Go. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, it wasn't funny, but it was supposed to be a joke. Uh, you know, they, they, just, there's such a demand for this uh, worldwide, you know, to save us from the drudgery of having to play Go ourselves. You know? uh, and I'm so glad that you guys have done such a fabulous uh, uh, job on, on that important societal issue. Um, so but, uh, my point is that you're going to do these particular, if you automate tasks, that's what you guys do. Everybody here, if you think about what you're trying to do, it's always task oriented, it's not job oriented. And how the jobs fit into this kind of matrix uh, is really the determining factor of whether we are making people more productive or whether we are putting them out of work. Yeah. There's an example actually that's pretty, um... Uh, often quoted, which is that of ATM and bank tellers. I, I'm sure you guys heard it before, mm -hmm. which is that when the um, ATMs came up, uh, there was a, a notion that, well, the bank teller job was going to be over. Uh, no one needed anyone to hand money at the counter anymore. And so there would be just less employment for these guys. And years later, studies found that employment had actually remained constant. And that's because uh, actually, of course, with an ATM, you, just, you needed less bank tellers in one bank. But then again, uh, you needed them still because you needed a human face and they upskilled and they did more things. And because you saved money and you had productivity, there just were more banks, more banks opened. The, here's a general principle I, I can put out for you. Automation changes the nature of work. It's the same title, different job. What a, what a teller did 30 years ago is very different. A teller is now a concierge to bank services. Before, they used to sit there and dole out money. So it, it, these things constantly change. Uh, my programming skills, to describe them as obsolete, would, would be too gracious and polite, <laughs> you know? I mean, I remember the days before, uh, before uh, object-oriented programming. We had structured programming. Anybody here remember that stuff? <laughs> One guy, how old are you? <laughs> 23? OK, well, it's structured. I love structured programming. I thought it was a great advance. Um, you know, the whole, if you look at the way database, I, we don't have time for this, but it's a fascinating thing. Look at the history of how databases uh, uh, were implemented and what happened as we moved from network and hierarchical models to the relational model and how that changed the nature of, of databases. But it made it so much more efficient and easier to implement. Everything is a database today. Uh, it used to be if you wanted to store data in a computer, you had to hire a group of programmers to figure out exactly what that particular application needed and program and structure it that particular way. Now, we, we can do that in a much more general way. So the point is, 
even if we call them the same thing, the jobs change. The job of a driver in the future may be very much of a concierge in a, uh, imagine a van that comes and picks you up. There may be somebody sitting there whose job it is to uh, sell you a drink or to provide you with some other kind of service during the time that you are in this vehicle as it's picking up and dropping off other people. So uh, there will be plenty of, uh, plenty of jobs that will just be a little bit different. Uh, we had a question from the live stream. Okay. Uh, why would insurance companies be motivated to lobby for self-driving cars oh, when that industry is born of human mistakes? Isn't it reasonable to assume that one of the potential losers here would be insurance companies as accidents go from one per 100,000 miles driven to one per one million miles driven? Well, the, the advantage is they work, like all businesses, on the spread, which is, uh, you know, what is it costing you and what can you get for it? So the first thing that's going to happen, I'm making this up, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't phrase it like that. I expect one of the things that might happen is that when you, if you have a self-driving car and I'm your insurance company, what I'm going to say in order to reduce my cost and payouts is if you get into an accident and uh, your, the car was on automatic, and so let's assume it can be driven manually or automatically, uh, which is controversial, as you guys, you guys know, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. It's a bad idea. But um, <laughs> uh, they'll say, if it, if it was on autopilot, so to speak, then uh, uh, we'll waive your deductible. You know, you don't have a deductible in the case of an accident. Now, uh, the reason for that is that the amount of money that they're going to save and the amount they're going to drop your insurance premium by is, is going to be less than the benefit to them. That's the spread. It's really, really that, that simple. So the insurance companies have a very strong incentive to, uh, to see a rollout of this kind of technology. It's true that it will transform their business as well, but people can get into all kinds of trouble, and I'm sure there will be many other things that, that uh, services that they can sell you in, in, in terms of, I'm not worried about the insurance companies. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I think they'll be, they'll be just fine. So the current AI paradigm relies very heavily on training data. And as we've seen in domains like bank lending and parole granting, historic injustices and racial profiling can be perpetuated into the AIs that are trained. We've done some work here on removing such biases from the networks. What do you think are the policy and legal issues that are going to get involved in inserting such value judgments into the utility functions that build these AIs? Well, here's an interesting way to look at this problem. I gave a talk to uh, the Mortgage Bankers Association, which, of course, is very concerned about exactly this issue. There are a lot of laws for very good social reasons that are in place to avoid uh, redlining and discrimination based on race, et cetera, et cetera. And they're subject to some very stringent uh, statistical tests uh, in the work that they do. Their problem is to the extent that human beings are involved in that decision-making process, they need to train those people and often those people do not perform in exactly the way that, that they want. So society has this problem today, but with respect to the people involved in that process. We are going to transfer that to the problem of these, these machine learning algorithms. OK, we're going to say you can't discriminate on the basis of race. But as you know, it can find a correlated uh, variable of some kind that has the same kind of effect. You know, We're not banning Muslims. We're just stopping immigration from certain countries, they just happen to be Muslim. Okay, so there are ways to, uh, to uh, uh, that you wind up with the same effect of discriminatory and unsatisfactory uh, social uh, results, uh, even though you've, you've uh, all you've, all I did was, uh, you know, program my, my uh, neural net, you know, to do this. So um, it's very important that we put the kinds of hooks and controls into these systems that will allow us to ensure that they meet our social standards. I was talking about that in terms of like standing in line, but this is another example. Do they perform in ways that we find acceptable as a society? That's going to be very, very important. Now, if you think about this as automation, as opposed to magic, you get a very different point of view about how to go about doing this. This is a question of engineering standards and practices. And I think what we're going to see, I hope, we will see an emergence in the field of artificial intelligence, a, an approach to uh, the, uh, st uh, the development, the testing, 
and the, the deployment of artificial intelligence systems that is uh, similar to what like the IEEE does for many other areas or um, civil engineers, they have standards for building bridges. You know, it has to meet certain kinds of criteria. Or chip testing, you know, there's a standard now that you need to apply to make sure that your chip meets its specifications. Well, we, we don't have that science yet. And part of that is this idea that we're, I'm sitting in a room here with wizards with hats on and it's all magic. And so you couldn't possibly uh, tell the machine what to do. It's going to make up its own mind. Well, of course, that's complete nonsense. So uh, I think what we need is a, a get the magic out of AI, get the gee whiz out of it, and start to talk about what kind of engineering practices and standards and techniques do we want to incorporate into these devices to ensure that they meet our societal values and that they abide by normal social conventions, which people find acceptable. Otherwise, my view isn't it that the robots ran amok. It's that we built bad tools. We, you know, we built you know, automated lawnmowers that run children down or something. Uh, that's where that, that kind of a problem comes in. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are multiple um, ways um, to, to deal with uh, people whose jobs get displaced. Um, one of them is uh, universal basic income. What are some of the others? Well, the, the biggest problem that I see is that our education system isn't really designed to turn out people whose skills are needed by the marketplace. Uh, there, there are many roles of education, but one of them is to train people to be productive members of society, and that means teaching them how to do certain kinds of jobs or, or, or tasks. And the problem we have is that the, the funder of our education, the lender of first resort, if you will, is the government. And the government has no incentive, there's no incentive built into that structure to ensure that the things that are being taught are the things that people need to know. So by way of example, and this is the worst audience to use this example in, but it works in other ones. I, we teach high school kids calculus. In my view, that's mostly a waste of time. They don't need calculus. I've never needed calculus. Now, many of you, how many people here use calculus? OK, there you go. So this is why it's a, this is where you need to, to learn calculus. But um, you know, the, the, the education that my children got at private schools here in the Bay Area is almost identical, surprisingly, not only in the content, but in the way it was delivered, which is shocking, to the education I had 40 or 50 years ago. That hasn't been responsive to the needs of the marketplace. Now, you guys know people like uh, Sebastian Thrun and uh, Andrew Wang, they're all, you know, they're doing things that close this loop by making the economics uh, tied to the, they're teaching the stuff that people need to know. Let me just put it that way. And the, the trick to making this work is to make sure that the investment that's being made has a likely payback. And the way you do that is by introducing the discipline of the marketplace and of uh, financial institutions who uh, will only, if they need a return on investment in investing in you to take a course, uh, they're only going to do that if they think there's a likelihood that's going to pay off. Like, they don't loan you money to build, buy or build any house anywhere. They do an appraisal on the house and see what it's worth and what's the neighborhood like. We need to do the same thing with education. What are the things that people really need to know uh, in order to get a job and to be productive? So uh, places like uh, Udacity and Coursera have begun to focus in on, by working with organizations like Google, on, well, what do, what do you guys really need? Uh, I talked to a young man uh, just two days ago who took a machine learning course on one of these online. He, it was like a three-month course or something like that. He was, he was amazed. He took a three-month course, and it doubled his income, and he, he got a new job. And it was fantastic. Not that he was great at it, not like you guys, but you know, he, it was very valuable for him. Whereas he could have gone back to school and gotten a master's degree in computer science and cost, I don't know what that cost today, you know, $100,000 or something, and spent two years. And it might not have been as valuable because they're going to be teaching him things which are not directly relevant to the work that he was going to be doing. So reforming the educational system so that we close this loop between investment and payback is one, another technique besides just handing out money. We just saw in the recent US election, uh, we have discovered some very negative social side effects of technology. The public commons has moved online in social media companies, and I'll include Google in this, although they're not primary um, among this, in such a way that it has fragmented public conversation 
and you, you've read a lot about the fake news issues and all that. The problem is that the economic interests of these organizations, which is to keep you on for just a few seconds longer so they can get one more ad in front of you, and that's worth millions of dollars, is uh, in uh, tension with the needs of a, a society, a democratic society, to have informed and uh, vibrant debate. And there are a lot of techniques that were used to affect the election by nefarious parties, both outside the United States and inside the United States, to abuse this new medium, communications medium, to sway things uh, for other, to benefit other people's interests and get people to do things that fundamentally were not in their, in their own interest. Here's what I want to say about that. The, we're in that oh my god moment. This was the classic Chernobyl moment as far as this, this thing goes. But the technology industry created this problem. And if you look at the history of every communications medium, a new communications medium throughout history, they've all had side effects, some of them like this or other negative side effects. And we have found ways to mitigate the negative effects of those communications mediums. This is a problem created by the technology industry, and that's you guys and me. And we have a primary responsibility for dealing with these side effects in very much the way that the question over here was about, you know, can we build AI systems that, that meet our, our normal standards? So I don't think we should throw up our hands. We're responsible for it. We have to fix this, and it can be done. So I can go on at some length about this, but, but if you look at what we've done for email, many, I'll just give you one example. Email, as you may know, 90% of all email that's sent is spam today. And yet we have built systems that manage to weed most of that out. Uh, there are similar kinds of techniques appropriately applied to our social media space that can restore balance to the public uh, discussion in the public space uh, that I think is going to be very important over the next five to 10 years. Otherwise, we're, we're heading for some real trouble with uh, the vibrancy and future, possibly, of our own democracy.